Hallelujah. Well, good afternoon. I'm a few minutes late to say today. Uh, welcome back to Gleanings in the Word, presented by Present True Fellowship Church. This is part of the ministry of the church. Uh, our whole thing is to teach the Word of God, to, to equip the saints so that they can fight the good fight of faith and come out victorious in their life. Today, uh, well, we've been talking about the act of begetting Christ in us or Christ being formed in us or coming into the fullness of his stature. Because the, the thing is, God wants the body, uh, the body of Christ to represent him. We are his representative in this world today. So before we get started, let us uh, pray. Let us go to the Father and ask his blessing and ask him to open our ears up that we might hear and our eyes that we might see what the Spirit has to say to us today. Father, we come to you and we realize that we can do nothing outside of you and that our, we totally rely on you. Your word says that the Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us into all truth and bring all things to our remembrance, Father. So we're relying on the Holy Spirit to speak to us today, God, to open our ears and our eyes that we might hear and see what you have to say. Father, we're asking for the anointing of the Holy Spirit because the anointing breaks every yoke, Father. And so, Father, we're coming to you as humble servants today, realizing how inadequate we are and how much we need your word in our lives, Father. Help us, God. Give us understanding. Give us wisdom in it. Give us knowledge in it, God. Open our hearts, God. Oh, Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for everything you do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, once again, welcome. We're so glad you're able to join us today. And if you're not, maybe you'll join us later. But we are so... Uh, I feel an honor and a privilege to teach the Word of God. I have been a minister for, uh, oh, 30, 40 years. I, I never keep track of time. Uh, I know that some do, but I, I have really don't. I know it's been that long, and uh, at least that long. And But I, I always count it a privilege, and I always take it very seriously when I stand up behind a pulpit to teach or preach the Word of God. God's been very good to us in, in this church here lately. We've had some tremendous services, uh, and God has, it just has blessed and anointed us. And this church is a vibrant church that is just ex exceeding all expectations. We are a church that has a goal to reach those who that are hurting, those who are lost, those who have no place. We are here to help as many people as we can. Glory to God. And so today I, I want to continue on Christ being formed in us or, uh, him, or the Holy Spirit begetting us. And remember as we begin this part of the Holy Spirit because uh, I believe this is a work of the Holy Spirit that forms Christ within us. I, I don't believe it's something that we can, uh, that we just, uh, that uh, we can do, but it's something the Spirit of God has to do in us. You know that uh, we we can't do anything. We can't even love like we should without the Holy Spirit. And so today, as we uh, dive into this, uh, we we talked about this act of begetting. We he, we talked about over in Galatians where Paul referred to it even as a travailing. Uh, and when we think about travailing, we think of a woman who, who gives a birth to a child that says they travail. Amen. And, and so Paul even refers this in Galatians 4.19, and we're just going to refer to this real quickly. But he says this, My little children of whom I travailed in birth again until Christ be formed in you. See, they had somewhere along the line had aborted the birth of Christ within them. They had went back to their old lifestyle. Because many of them, you know, when they, when they uh, got saved back in those days, when they came out of the Jewish synagogues and, 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 and that, they were almost ostracized. Uh, people didn't want them around them, you know. And, and so uh, there was that strong pull to go back to that because it's what they knew. It's, we're, 
all their life, that's what they knew. The, the, uh, the, the temple and all, all the sacraments of the temple, they, that's all they knew. So to come out of that and to be separated not only from uh, family but and friends and family both, it, it, it was a very hard life for them to do. And so Paul comes back to them and he says, I have to do this work all over again. And so we're going to kind of pick up on that. We're <laughs> so how many of you remember when you received Christ in your life? I do. I remember as a community Christian church here in St. Joseph, Missouri, uh, I give my heart to God, I, I, and I, I don't know the date, and I don't know what he preached, but I tell you what, I know what the Holy Spirit, I knew the conviction of the Holy Spirit in my life and that he was drawing me. And at that point, Christ was birthed within me. And I began to grow up into the fullness of the stature of Christ. Amen. I began to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. So in Philippians, Paul gives this warning, put no confidence, Philippians 3, 3, put no confidence in the flesh. Because sometimes we think that by doing things, we're, we're growing. But it's not about what we're doing. Because, listen, what if, what if we would all have the, Paul's attitude in our daily what? Simply allowing the Spirit of Christ to do in and through us what we know we cannot do in our own strength. Because I can't, uh, I don't really know how to say this, but it really escaping me at this time. But I don't know how to say how that I cannot uh, form him in my life. It takes the Spirit of God to form. There's nothing I can do to cause him to be formed. I have to allow the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, if Christ is being formed in me, uh, I become that new creature in Christ. I am no longer that old person I once was, but I'm a new creature in Christ. And all this is done by the working and the power of the Holy Spirit. See, so when you see someone who has stopped thinking about what God can do and started thinking about what he can do for God, listen to me, now listen to me, he has entered out of the sphere of of, of in him, of in Christ, in essence, into the spirit of in himself, walking in legalism. Be very careful in this area. It can be very subtle and sound, very spiritual to say, I'm going to do something for Jesus. I probably have said that, you know. Uh, uh, and, man, these things are sticking together today. But, the point is that if not the Holy Spirit and you're initiating the deed, if the Holy Spirit is not initiating this, if he's not starting that work and empowering it and anointing it, you can hang it all up because you're, it's a work of the flesh and not a work of the Spirit. It may look good. It may sound good. Your eyes and others may think, oh, man, this is great, but will bear fruit for eternity. John 15, 16. Uh, let's read that in our uh, Bibles. I'm, I want to pull it up here on my pad, but if I can, John 15, 16 says this. Uh, John 15, 16. Listen. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whosoever, you, whatsoever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. That's what he says. Now listen, he says this, that whatever we do, it must be a work of the Holy Spirit in our life, because it's a work of the flesh. There is not going to be no fruit from that. But if it's a work of the Holy Spirit, there's always going to be uh, something produced. Some light's going to come out of it. Fruit's going to come out of that union with the Spirit. Over in Isaiah 5.20, he gives us this warning. Yeah, listen, what, but he gives us a warning. Listen to what it says. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute to Substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. We may call a lot of things good that God calls evil. 
So Isaiah gives us warning so that whatever we do, let us examine it and let it not be of ourselves, but let it be of the Spirit of God. For he is the only one that can produce fruit that is eternal and will remain. Amen. And so when you, when you uh, let the Spirit of God do this in your life, it's an eternal work. It's a, uh, it's a work that is everlasting. Now, Romans 13, 14 says this, But put you on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So, putting on Christ, is, it's a strong and vivid metaphor. It means more than put on the character of the Lord Jesus Christ, signifying rather let Jesus Christ himself be, the, be the, a strong and beautiful expression for the most intimate union with him. And being clothed with all grace, which were in him, including receiving in faith and love, every part of his doctrine, obeying his precepts, initiating his, in imitating his example, adorning ourselves therewith as with a splendid robe, not to be put off because the, glad, the garb intended for the eternal day, which is never to be followed by night. Putting on Christ is a strong and vivid metaphor. The apostle doesn't tell us this. He doesn't say put on purity and sobriety and peacefulness and benevolence. But he says all this and a thousand times more at once is saying put on Christ. And make no provision for the flesh. To raise foolish and sinful desires in our hearts or when they are raised already to devise means to gratify them. See, putting on Christ is more than just following his example. It's a way, children, we grow up to become like their parents. Not only do they follow their example, but they have their genes. When we are in Christ, he enables us to live more and more like him. I love, I love God's word, and I love teaching his word. And my whole desire is to let Christ be seen in me. And I realize that his flesh is a, hinders that at times. You know, how is Christ seen in us? How is he formed in us? He is done, it's done by the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, it says, listen to what he says, and make no, put, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. When I hear the word put on, I think of putting a garment on. Or putting a coat on here, it's it's starting to turn cold here in Missouri, and and so when I think uh, I I know I got to put on an extra garment before I go outside, or I'm going to be cold, and so putting on garment putting on a garment is like uh, we're allowing we're putting on the persona of Christ in our life. We are becoming more and more like Him every day. We are being transformed. Romans twelve two: Be not conformed to the image of this world, but you tra be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we're not to be conformed to what the world looks like. There's so many Christians, they say they're Christian, but they, they live more like the world. They act more like the world. Uh, uh, they don't really per, uh, uh, express Christ in their life. They express more of the worldly things. And so therefore, this is what's happening in our churches today. We, we have not presented Christ. We are now uh, uh, speaking enough about him. We're, 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 we're more about entertaining anymore. And we, we bring in big names. Not here. We don't have the money to bring in big names. But they bring in big names. They bring in big preachers. And they want to draw a crowd. And it's not about the crowd but it's how many lives are being changed. It's how many lives is Christ working through to bring them into the fullness of his stature. How many lives are putting on the Lord Jesus Christ? How many of us are allowing him to be formed within us so that we are reflecting him and not ourselves? See, I had that propensity to go back and, and, and be just like I was, but because of the power of the Holy Spirit, 
That's how I overcome that flesh. That's how I overcome and, and make no provision for the flesh because I have not the power to do it. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm able to overcome this flesh. I'm able to subdue it because of his power. Paul wrote over to Ephesians 6, saying, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. It's not our might. It's his might, his Holy Spirit. He is the power of God, and he is manifested in our lives to subdue this flesh so that we look like Christ. We act like Christ. We walk like Christ. We are his creation. Well, it's just putting on Christ is more than just following his example. It is the way children grow up. It's how we grow up. Uh, you know, we I've heard uh, parents say, uh, do as I tell you, not a, uh, how do they put it? Uh, do as I say, not as I, okay, let me say it this way because I can't seem to get this right. But let me say this. Uh, when an adult smokes, they tell their children not to smoke. But the example is that they are smoking, so their action sometimes speaks louder than their words because if it's all right for the adult, then the child thinks it should be all right for them. And, and so uh, sometimes our actions are louder than our words to our children. If we're going to tell them not to do something, then we ought to be not doing that ourselves. Amen. We should set the example. So Christ set us the example. He died to the oh the self. I mean, he did not allow it to have no place within him, and so he was the example. And so, when we raise children up, we we raise them by example, and we raise them by words that show the example. See, the ancient Jews frequently used this phrase of putting on. Uh, as for the Shekinah or the divine majesty signify the souls being clothed with immortality and, and rendered it fit for glory. To be clothed with a person is a Greek phase signifying to assume the interests of another, to enter into his views, to imitate him and be holy on his side. It is the idea of identification with the other person. Have you ever heard that saying, I can identify with them? And why are we saying that? Because we feel the same way they do. We, we believe the same way they do. And so we can identify with them. Well, we ought to be identifying with Christ. And that's only going to happen by the Spirit of God beginning to manifest Him within our lives. So we need to, to act in obedience to the Spirit's voice and, and His power in our life because i got to tell you, every day, He's trying to form Christ in us. He's trying to bring us into the fullness of the stature of Him, but He has sometimes to crucify that old nature, that old flesh, so that we can walk in the newness of life in, in Christ. Listen to what He says in Romans eight twenty nine. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might not be the firstborn among many brethren. Let's read that once again. I really want eight, Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. The word conformed is the Hebrew word samorphal, to bring the same form with the same other person or thing, to render or like. The noun morphe refers to the outward expression of the inward essence or the nature, our inward nature. <coughs> See, we had this saying, out of the abundance of the heart and the mouth speaketh. What it's saying is, what's in here comes out here. And, 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 you know, then we say, I wish I could take that back. But sometimes the words we say can't be taken back. Well, it really never can be taken back. They're, they've been spoken. They're, they're out there, you know. And so, uh, but there's an inward change that more, and it's the same word that we use over in, uh, well, 
many places in the Bible, not many places, but it talks about the transformation that happened to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. It's the same thing, that he was transformed in, their, in front of the disciples' very eyes, amen? And, and it's the same thing as uh, over in Romans 12, 2, I quote it, be not conformed to the image of this world, but be transformed. That word transform is that same word in the essence of that same word. And that is the word that we use in, the, in our English language is to be transformed from a caterpillar to a beautiful butterfly. But you realize there, there's a process uh, of that that goes on to come, to come from here to here. And so, brother and sister, Christ is not formed in us overnight. We have to be transformed by the power of his Holy Spirit, the working of his Holy Spirit. Sometimes he brings us into that place, and we are an ugly person. We are, uh, how many have ever seen a caterpillar? It's not a pretty thing. It's ugly. But yet... Out of that ugliness, God brings something beautiful into transformation. He transforms us. Christ is being formed in us. Let's face it, none of us look good. When they asked Jesus, uh, he said, there is none good, no, not one, not even me, but the Father is the only good one. And, and, and so uh, when we, uh, we don't like to think of ourselves as being ugly, but really until we are transformed, we are that ugly caterpillar. We are that thing that uh, we just, it's ugly, we detest it. And you know, they go through that process, they begin to spin that cocoon and they live in that cocoon. And when they burst out of that that cocoon, they're a beautiful butterfly. There is a process that goes on. And so, brother and sister, there's a process going on in each of our lives. You know, we had that saying, uh, Christ is still working on me, making what, me what I ought to be. I, I'm not what I want to be. I'm, I'm not what I ought to be. But I know that that transformation is happening when I allow the Holy Spirit to work in my life. How, do, how does that really work? How, how is he transforming? What is he transforming? Well, he's transforming our, our very nature. Because it says that we, uh, we've been given a new nature in Christ. We're, we're not the old person but we had that propensity to allow the old to come back. Amen. And really, that's what Paul was writing to the, you, you, you went back. I've got to come back and I've got to travail all of this over again. I've got to birth you uh, again in the spirit. Because they kind of aborted that that was happening in their life. Now, so we're being transformed, right? And how does this work? How does it happen? How, how are we being transformed? How, it, it's because, okay, think about how you would react to some situation before you were saved. And now, think about how you react to that same situation after you've given your heart to Christ. It, is not your reaction different if it isn't, then maybe you really haven't given your heart to God because there's a transformation that happens. We, we no longer, uh, I hate to use this example, but it's so evident how we used to say, I hate that person. And, and I, don't, I don't like that person. You know, I really don't believe a Christian say, say any of those things. I, I believe that Every person, every man, woman, and child is a, a creation of God and should be treated as so. Granted that some are not very nice people. But you know that God does love everyone, not just you. He loves, he loved you before you got saved and he loves them. And so it's hard for us to relate to that. So we have this propensity. I, I hope that we as Christians are not saying I hate somebody. Because really, that should not be in our vocabulary. There should be a transformation in our hearts going on. And, and uh, to say that I hate somebody, that's such a strong word, word. And you know, in our world today, that word is rampant. In our nation today, it, it really concerns me that we're so divided anymore. And there's so much hate and anger in our, our society today. 
This is not the transformation that God was looking for. The transformation that God was looking for us to be. If you read in the Gospels, if you take your Bible up and read the Gospel of John, just start there. Read the Gospel of John. It won't take you long. Sit down and read that Gospel. You know what? You need to read the Gospel of John three times, three or four times. Let it get in your spirit. Let it begin to transform you. So that you began to realize who Christ was and what he did. He was compassionate. He was loving. He was forgiving. He was gentle. He was me. He was all those things, see. And because, but we live in a society today that prefers to hate and be angry all the time. They're not being transformed. They've not given their life to Christ. They're like the Galatians. Maybe they had an experience with Christ, but it wasn't a true transformation. Christ didn't have time to be formed in them, and they aborted the process before the, the life came out of them. And maybe it's because they hate. Maybe it's because of anger. Maybe because of bitterness. There's, there, there's a lot of things that we can do that can abort the formation of Christ within our lives. We can allow these things to come into our life. Maybe it's doubt. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's unbelief. All these things hinder the process of Him being formed in us. Because when we begin to allow that life to be performed, to be formed in us, we come into the image of His Son. People no longer see us, but they see the love of God. They see the joy of God. They see the peace of God. They, they see the strength of God, how that we can go through a situation and remain strong, not because of us, but because the Holy Spirit is forming Christ within us, and we no longer are controlled by the flesh. He says, walk, not in, uh, uh, walk in the Spirit and allow no... Uh, I can't think of it now. <laughs> Excuse me. But walk in the spirit that you feel not, fulfill not the lust of the flesh. So we're no longer controlled by that flesh anymore. But Christ is being formed in us. But I, I think there's a really a strong warning here. Because as this, he said that uh, they went back into Judaism. Uh, and there is even more talk about that over in Hebrews that, where it says they crucified Christ anew and afresh because they went back to the law. They went back to the legalism. They went back to, to doing on their own and not allowing Christ, the Holy Spirit, to form Christ in them. They, they were doing the work. They said, well, you know, it's just like this. Some of us had this mindset that if I'm a good person and I do good things, I'm going to make it to heaven. You're not allowing Christ to be formed in you. You're doing the work yourself. You're saying that I'm good enough to get to heaven without Christ. You're, you're saying that the cross was of no pur had no purpose because you're saying that you can get to heaven by doing your uh, good things and being a good person. If that was so, Christ didn't have to come and be nailed on that cross. If we're not allowing him to be formed in us, to be birthed within us, for us to begin to reflect his image, we can be a good person and not make heaven our home. I don't like saying that, but it is the truth. And it's such a lie today. So many today think, well, I'm a good person. God, will not, God won't do any bad to me. I'm a good person. Brother and sister, God didn't have anything to do with it. God said it. Give us the, the uh, standards in his book. He told us how to live our life, and it's up to us. If we, if we refuse the knowledge... And we know, we know that it's not right, and we, but we think we can go around it. We can't. The Bible says, if you try to ascend to heaven any other way, you're a thief and a robber. And so when we begin to rely on ourselves, when we begin to think it's about me and what I'm doing, look at me and look what I'm doing. And I'm not saying everybody does good works. That's not it. I, I know some that do a lot of good things. And it's not because they want to be seen. It's because they want to help people. And that's very good. But they need to know Christ. They need to know Him as their Savior. They need to glorify Him in their lives. They need to exemplify Him. 
See, on, I just want to tell you about this. On a wall near the main entrance to the Alamo in San Antonio, Texas, is a portrait with the following inscription. James Butler Boham. No picture of him exists. This portrait is of his nephew. Major James Bond, deceased, who greatly resembled his uncle, is placed here by a family that people may know the appearance of the man who died for freedom. No literal portrait of Jesus exists either. But the likeness of the Son will make us free. Can be seen in the lives of his true followers. So we have no portrait of Jesus, but when we really follow him, he can be seen. Isn't that amazing? You know, when we read Romans 8.29, but the verse before that in Romans 8.28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. It's an easy verse to believe when the sun is shining. It's something entirely else when darkness is all around and tragedy has hit our life, we doubt this verse for two reasons. First, Paul says we know. You hear, remember I said, and we know all things. Paul said we know. Do you know? And when most of us don't feel like we know, Paul says we know when most of us don't feel like we know. And then the second thing is, is Paul says all things. When most of us would rather say some things work for our good. But Paul says all things. We know and all things work together for our good. So the, the key word here is really good. It's good for us. Good usually means happiness, health, prosperity, and good fortune. That's, we like that good, don't we? We like health. We like good uh, prosperity. These, those things are indeed good, but God, God's good it far exceeds our limited vision. Because in 29, he tells us that God's good is that we should be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Anything that makes us look like Jesus is good. This gives an entirely new perspective to heartaches and tragedies. They are part of God's plan to chip away little by little of our character until Jesus is fully formed in us. Oh, well, we don't like that chipping away because that's the old nature. And sometimes we like to hang on to things. We don't want to get rid of them. And, and we may have felt the Holy Spirit dealing in our life and uh, and, and, and telling us, you, you can't do that anymore. You can't say that mo no more. You can't act like that anymore. That's not who you are now. You're that new creature now. You have to show the goodness of God. You have to show the love of God. And so in all this process, this, this us being formed into his image, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's sometimes very painful because, let's face it, sometimes we like the things we do. And we make excuses for them. But what we're doing is hindering the formation of Christ in our life. Almost to the point where we're bringing forth a, uh, a defect. That what we're presenting as Christ is not Christ at all, but it's something we have formed in ourselves. We're trying to make Christ look the way we want him to look, and he wants to be formed in the way he is supposed to look. Does that make sense? I think it really does. I think there's some kind of deep truth right there that uh, we're, we're trying to uh, uh, portray Christ in the way we want to portray him. And he, the Holy Spirit, is wanting to portray him in the way God wants him portrayed, and that's through his word. Amen. This book will transform your life. I'm telling you, you need to read the Bible. You need to pray. You need to come to church. You need to be a part of a local church, not just a pew setter, but you need to be a working member in the church. And, and, 
Because the Bible says, and we're going to, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but every one of us have a, uh, a purpose in the church. So, when we know, when we understand, we know in all things, when we understand those two concepts, that really it's not about us becoming happy and, and all that prosperity and health and everything, but it's about Him being formed in us. God is chipping away at that old nature. I told you, it, it's not, it doesn't happen overnight. I've heard people say, they'll never change. No, they'll never change as long as they're trying to effect the change in their own power. The only way true change comes is the Holy Spirit begins to change us and we become that new creature in Christ. We become, we are allowing Christ to be formed in the. That is the only way true change comes. Now I'd like to take this to more scriptures here today if you'll allow me. If you have in your Bibles, turn to Ephesians 4 to 13. And, and this may seem like I'm not talking about, I'm still talking about Christ being formed in the begetting of him, him being birthed within our life, and us coming into the fullness of the stature of him, being, uh, to, that we conform to the image of his son. And see, uh, I, let me just say something about that word conform once again. Is that we, uh, we conform to the image of something. We all do. Uh, uh, have you ever had somebody say, well, you can tell that to the father, He's a, tell who his father is. And they may be talking about his character, or they may be talking about his looks. Well, you can see he's a Reynolds, and I've heard that many times. You can see he's a Reynolds, uh, because the Reynolds have certain characteristics that kind of carries forth in our family. And, and, and or, uh, or they'll say, that, that he's his father's son. You know, because of that character or the nature, have you ever looked at uh, your children and think, and see, and you, act, you actually look at them, you'll say, see that they sometimes say the same things you do. They act the way, they, uh, uh, they have the same beliefs you have because that is what you've, you've exemplified to them. And so they're being conformed to your image of you. Amen. Now, in our society today, that's kind of horrible because we live in a society today that's full of abuse of all sorts. <laughs> Excuse me. And so uh, he, he is being conformed. We conformed. To, I can remember when uh, Michael Jackson uh, come out with that white glove on his hand. Well, every little kid wanted a white glove on their hand. They, they were being conformed to the, his image. They, they, they wanted to look like Michael Jackson because they thought, oh, that's great, I want to. Or, 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 or any other sports figure or star or hero, we, we kind of become conformed to their image. We be, uh, but Christ saying is this, we be conformed to the image of him, of him in our life. We're to exemplify him in our lives. People to see Jesus and not us. Listen to what it says in Ephesians 4.13. Till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and to a perfect man under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What a mouthful. There is so much depth here in this one verse. Till we all come to the unity of faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God. Under the perfect man. Under the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. Knowledge of the Son of God. This is not a reference to the knowledge of Christ. But which we were first say. But refers to something very deeper. Something very intimate. I, I realize this. Uh, uh, we've been preaching in the church about prayer. And how that prayer is really uh, an intimate conversation between you and the Father. And, uh, and we, we looked at, we've been trying to get to the place where we look at the, the form of the prayer. That Jesus said, uh, when they, the disciples came to his Lord, teach us to pray. Because they seen something in Jesus when he prayed that was different from anybody else they had seen. 
So they wanted to be conformed to the image. They wanted to know that intimate. They wanted that knowledge that he had, that intimacy with the Father. So he says this, till we all come to the unity, to the knowledge of the Son of God, to the knowledge of the Son of God, more intimate, more experiential knowledge of Him, not knowing about Him, but knowing Him. See, a lot of us know all about Christ. We can tell you about His birth. We can tell you about His uh, His walk on the earth for, for 33 and a half years. We, we can tell you about the miracles and, and the healings and, and the compassion and, and how, he, how He walked and He healed. And, and, and we can tell you about the cleansing of the lepers. And we can tell you about His crucifixion. And we can tell you about His resurrection. But that's all we know. We don't know Him. We know all the about him we know facts and figures but we don't have an intimate relationship we don't have an intimate knowledge of him because we've never sat down with him and shared now listen uh, uh, for years and I've uh, I've wanted this is that uh, I before Adam fell and it says this in Genesis that he walked in the cool of the evening with the father how cool is that to walk with the creator of everything. The one who created me. The one who formed me out of the dust of the earth and breathed the breath of life within me. And how cool is it he brought every animal before me and I named every animal. How cool was that I could sit in the cool of the evening, walk in the cool of the evening with God and we could have a conversation. Man, wouldn't you like to do that? Wouldn't you like to be in the Adam? Wouldn't you like to heard their conversation? I would have. But there was men all down through the ages that had that intimate thing, that, uh, that intimate relationship with Christ. And it's going to take that intimacy for him to be formed in us, for us to be conformed to him. This is a growing encounter. This is the Lord Jesus himself being formed in us. That we come to know him more and more, and not just about him. But know him directly and personally. This is a glorious component of a maturing faith. Don't become discouraged for this growing is the deeper knowledge for this growing in the deeper knowledge of the Son of God is a lifelong process. We, this is something that can't be rushed. You ever heard somebody, you just can't rush this. This this you have to take time to do this. And that's true about him. We we cannot rush this process. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to begin to do that work in our life, that maturing and growing in him into that intimate relationship. As we grow in him, as we go into the fullness of his stature, we begin to have that inner intimate relationship with him we begin to know the mind of christ we begin to understand we begin to move in that fashion with him we are formed in him my goodness i talk too much i i can't even get through this because but this is so important for us to understand that we have to allow the holy spirit to form him in us this is not a work we can do ourselves this is allowing him to change us it's a lifelong process as I, I, I think about this, as a, as a baby, it starts out with a seed and an egg and it's formed in a, a mother's womb and it begins to grow. And it takes nine months for that baby to come to maturity where he's fully formed so that he can be birthed. But the process takes a while in a mother's womb. And so we cannot rush, uh, uh, you know, we have the what we call... Uh, preemie babies that are born before their time, you know, and, and, and so some of us are trying to uh, rush the, the, the time, the, the incubation time, the time that we're being formed so that he becomes, be seen in us. We can't rush the process. The process has to take its time. It has to form Christ within us if, it, if we don't try, if we try to rush the process or, or uh, or do that, we might come out with a deformity. 
And that's why we sometimes we see with Christians sometimes, they've, they've rushed the process, and so that's why we sometimes see them hate. Say, I hate somebody. And then say they're a Christian. Because they've rushed the process. They've not come to conformity. They've not been born to the image of him. So don't get discouraged about the process. Allow the process to work. Because without the process, there can be no Christ being birthed within us. He cannot be conformed in us. His image cannot be seen in us. It's a lifelong process. He's still being formed in me. I still sometimes say things or do things or think things that I should not. I'm still being conformed to his image. I'm still, he's still being formed in me so that I react the way he would react. I love the way he loves. I have joy, the joy he has. I have peace, the peace he has. It's not mine, it's him. He's being conformed in me. And the more I have that intimacy with him, the more I come to the knowledge of, of him, that intimate place with him, then I'm being transformed. I remember as a, uh, as a teenager, I spent a lot of time with my dad. And we had some very uh, great conversations over the years. I used to ride around a, uh, he used to carry uh, the paper, St. Joseph paper, and he had a rural route, and I used to ride with him and and help him, and we would talk. Uh, We had long talks sometimes. And, you know, I, I become more intimate with my dad than ever because I spent time with him, you know. You know what the thing is is that uh, I I was probably more intimate with my dad than my brothers because I spent lots of time with my dad. And so my relationship with him was very strong. And because of that relationship, I was... I wish I was could say I was a lot like my dad. My dad was a very tremendous person and very unselfish person. And uh, I found myself to be selfish at times. I, 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 I don't. Uh, I want things that pleases me. It doesn't matter what others want. But I'm trying to to allow that to be taken out of me. The Holy Spirit. I. I tell you, I've had some real struggles here lately with that. Him being, I know it's him being formed in me. I know that sometimes there's there's growing pains, and and I know there's times when it uh, we uh, I yeah, we, it's just a struggle for us. It, it's a real battle, and but I realize this more and more. The more time I spend with him, the more I'm intimate with him the easier the battle gets. The formation of him becomes more and more in my life because I come to, when I spend that intimate time with God, you know the best way to do that is to get down on your You don't have to get on your knees, but spread the Bible out and begin to read it and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Now we know that in the growing process, uh, uh, we have to eat certain things that uh, helps us to to facilitate our growth, right? And so, even in the spiritual realm, it's the same way. You remember, mom, your mom and dad used to tell you, "Now eat your veggies." You know, uh, we don't like veggies. We don't understand why should we eat them? We don't like them because it didn't please us. And and that's the same way. Sometimes God spreads a, da- uh, uh, a table before us, and he says, eat, come and dine and eat. And we go, I don't want to eat that. I don't like that. It's not pleasing to me. But sometimes we have to eat things that are not pleasing to us because it brings strength to us. It helps us allow Christ to be formed in us. Amen. And so the Word of God is our necessary food. Jesus said himself, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. If Christ is going to be formed in you, if you're going to be conformed to his image, if you're going to be transformed, you're going to have to have prayer in reading the word of God. Read it. I mean, lay it out. Say, Lord, let me just 
He, it says in Psalm, I just I opened it up right here. It says, Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise is calmly for the upright. That's speaking to us. First off, he tells us to rejoice. Now, we all know that it's not easy to rejoice always. But he goes on, he said, O oh, you righteous, for praise is what? Comely, or and comely means beautiful for the upright. So that's how we, 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 we get into this word. We, we lay it out as we pray and we say, Father, help me, speak to me through your word. And God will speak to you through this word. Prophecy is nice, prophets are nice, but God wants to speak to you personally. And you know what? Most prophecy and prophet already confirms what God has already been speaking to your heart. I don't know how I got into all that, but he, in that intimate place, that place of conversation we have, we come full circle. This is where the apostle began. The church is to fulfill its calling. The calling of demonstrating to the world a new character, a spirit of lowliness and love and unity coupled with resurrection power and proving that the church is a body inhabited by God himself. I feel that, and I'm not... I feel that we fail God so many times. But in this process of growing in that intimate place, sometimes we learn more about God's grace and God's mercy and God's love when we fail. And we even learn how to appreciate that in our life. And we, then we begin to learn that intimate place where he's forming his love in our life. He's forming his mercy, his grace in our life. I don't know why, but I don't know what time it is. I... I'm probably going to have to stop here. I got five minutes. And so, he tells us that, now listen to what he said again. And, uh, well, I can't find it. My goodness, where is it? Oh, I'm way over out of the way here. So don't get discouraged. To a mature man, mature man conveys the ideal that God wants believers to fulfill their or their humanity. Design which he intended for each of us when he created the first man and the first woman. Ponder this. Incredible thought for a moment. What satisfaction is satisfaction to be all that all God, the wise God created us to be? What satisfaction do you get out of that, being all that all, all that God created you to be? I, I, I'm not there. I, I got to tell you, I, I feel like, uh, I feel like my, uh, I have a, had the problem because sometimes I want to procrastinate. I want to put things off when they need to be addressed. You know, there's situations rise up and I really want to address them because I know it's going to cause conflict or it's going to cause problems. And I don't want to, or sometimes I don't know, I don't want to hear the answer. I'm afraid of the answer I'm going to receive. And I'm not coming in. That's being immature. That's not allowing Christ to form in me because I'm being immature. I'm not uh, addressing the situation I should be addressing and I'm procrastinating. See, I've felt for a long time that I, I need to be out there volunteering more than I am. But every day I don't do it. And so uh, I've, I've felt the urgency of the Spirit here lately more and more on this. And, and so I've... It's part of the process for me. It's part of the growing in me. So that's an incredible thought, to think that we could be all that he wants us to be. 
Not to be the richest, not to be the smartest, not to be the best looking, but to be what God originally intended for us. This surely a mountain worthy of the cost it will take to climb it. Some may see it as an arrival, but I think it's a pursuit. Like Paul's pressing onward to the oh, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. To be all you can be in Christ and for all the glory of God. It is important to realize that according to this passage in Ephesians, the supreme purpose of the church is not to evangelize the world. Oh, I got to stop there. I'm running out of time. Amen. Yeah, I got two minutes. But next week, we're going to pick up back with that verse. And we'll be going down to Ephesians 4, 14 through 15 and 16, 17, 18, I think it is. And we're going to be talking more about Christ being formed in us, his begetting within us. And so I thank you for joining me today. And I, I've, I, I always tell you this, this teaching, is, this uh, outline is available to you. Uh, you can follow along with this. I, I will give it to you free. I don't charge anything for it. I'll send it to you. All you got to do is uh, I'm on Facebook, you can, Terry Reynolds, or you can go to our church Facebook page, Present True Fellowship, our group page, and you can request this, and I will gladly send it to you. Post is free, and it's yours free of charge, and you can follow along. Every Friday we have Gleaning in the Word. I, I've really felt like this was God, and I've tried to obey Him. I know that I've failed many times, but... Uh, I, I've tried to do my best to teach the Word of God. I believe it's so important. And so if you uh, would like that material, please just ask for it, and we will be glad to send it to you. And, oh man, it's, it's wonderful to know Him. So let's, let's close on a word of prayer. Uh, Father, we come to you today as humble servants. We are thankful as always for your Word. We're thankful for the Holy Spirit who is doing a work within each and every one of our lives. The process is going on. It's not easy sometimes. We have those pains and growing pains. We have things that rise up that try to hinder our growth in you. But God, let us press on as Paul did. Press toward the mark of the high calling in you. Press on till you be formed in us, not by our power, but by the power of your Holy Spirit. Let him transform us. Let him conform us into your image, Father. We're grateful today for this opportunity. Father, right now I pray for each and every person. Bless them. Strengthen them and encourage them. Fill them with your presence, Lord. Oh, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed it, and God bless you.